Okay, it is 10.03 and we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Kim Folsom of Founders First. I am delighted to uh, host you as the moderator for today's COVID-19 Essentials webinar. And I am so excited and looking forward to the topic because as everyone's talked about so much about the COVID-19 um, pandemic as well as the events uh, of the, um, with regards to the murder of uh, George Floyd, there's been a lot of stressed anxiety and uh, uh, pent up frustration that's gone on in our environment. Um, and as us fellow CEOs having to uh, make an impact and run our business, we're always looking for inside secrets and best practices to uh, do more um, to advance our, our missions of our organization. So today I'm excited because we've got a topic and a panel of experts that are gonna help us with doing just that. Uh, if you can proceed, um, Chris, to the next slide. So our, today with today's webinar, um, we're going to cover an introduction and the purpose. Uh, we're going to start out with talking about CEO, CEO wellness, physical wellness, mental wellness, diet and exercise. Uh, but before we go through and do all of that, uh, we're going to get a chance to uh, get an introduction and overview about our panel of experts. Next slide, please. Uh, we're joined today by just an awesome, awesome group of folks that I have had a chance to come to know in the last uh, couple few years. Uh, we've, and you're going to get a chance to get a detailed insight um, before we get going with various topics, but starting with uh, Dr. Divya Kakaya, who is an integrated clinical psychologist and the founder of Healthy Within. We also have Dr. Anthony Frank, who is a natural pathologic doctor and with the Nourish uh, Medical Center. We've also got Tara Coleman, who is a clinical nutritionist. And um, you're going to hear in a few moments a bit of a detail about their specific uh, expertise and specialties. Uh, next slide, please. Again, these webinars, this uh, COVID-19 essential webinars are designed for the small business owner, be it you're a micro small business owner that's running a uh, consultancy practice uh, that could be uh, a few folks, or if you're a mid-sized business that's uh, a solution provider uh, that has maybe uh, 10 to 20 people or a larger a team of 50 or more uh, individuals. The messages that we're delivering is targeted for you and helping you better run your business. Next slide. So the purpose of today's webinar is specifically to you, the CEO, and how you can take care of your physical and mental well-being during this stressful and challenging times with advice from our experts. Next slide. So we're gonna start out with uh, a wellness spotlight from Tara Coleman. Uh, Tara, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about you and your practice? Thank you, Kim, I'd love to. Uh, hey guys, my name is Tara Coleman. I am a clinical nutritionist. Um, I was not born a nutritionist by any means. I think I was born like most people. I grew up in the suburbs of Virginia. I you know, loved fast food. I, you know, was, um, had a single parent that was working all the time and working really, really hard. So I think I was kind of like everyone else where I didn't even really think about food. I thought, you know, what's quick and easy. Um, I was, however, I think born a scientist. Um, I've always loved science. I started my career, um, my undergrads in biotechnology, and I started my career as a chemist um, in the biotech industry. Um, and honestly, I loved it. I wore my lab coat every day, did all those types of things. Um, but a couple years into it, I found that um, I was showing some warning signs for some, some pretty serious health concerns. Um, you know, things that we're probably all used to. My cholesterol was high. I was showing high levels in, of inflammation. And my doctor said, you know, you need to really look at, at your diet. And honestly, I'd never even thought it. So I figured, you know, I'd go read a book and go on the internet and the, you know, figure out what to eat to be super easy. Dr. Google can certainly help me out. 
Um, and I tried that and I got overwhelmed and discouraged because everything said something different. So at that point, I ended up going back to school. And uh, really what I found was, you know, everyone's looking for a one size fits all solution. And if they do, right on, you'll not find anyone happier than me. That would make me so excited. Um, but really what I specialize in is um, really educating my individual clients about the best way to eat for them, but more importantly, how to actually do it. Because nutrition is a science, you know, that, is, that much is true, but eating is a behavior. And so the, the people that I work with have trouble applying the information. Yes, they know fruits and vegetables are good. Yes, they know lean proteins are good, but how do I do that in the context of my every single day life? Um, so mostly I work with individuals that have cycled on and off diets. Um, right now I'm really specializing in helping us to adapt to a new normal. You know, we're in a situation where we can't rely on a lot of our old solutions, like picking some, something up from the grocery store or ordering in. We're, we're building new skills like cooking and preparing foods and things like that. Um, so my my goal is to simplify the nutrition noise, because if you're honest, you've probably heard a lot of different opinions about, about nutrition. Um, teach behavioral solutions to cut down on overwhelm, decision fatigue, or in short, you know, what are we gonna eat tonight? Um, and then ultimately talk a lot about emotional eating, you know, understanding how to um, prevent and deal with emotional eating so you can kind of stay on track and stay consistent. And I do this through one-on-one -on -one consultations. I do this through, um, I have an online course. And then I do public speaking, um, both through, through webinars or on, on local media, like CBS, NBC, things along those lines. Well, thank you so much for giving us that insight, uh, Tara. And I look forward to our uh, discussion about those key strategies. Uh, if you can advance to the next slide, and I can introduce our next uh, expert on our panels. Uh, so our wellness spotlight next is with Dr. Anthony Frank. And uh, uh, Anthony, uh, Dr. Frank, please tell us uh, a bit about your background and your area of specialty. Yes, of course. Thanks, Kim. So I'm Dr. Anthony Frank. I'm a naturopathic doctor. And um, I'll start off by saying my interest in, let's say, medicine all started when I was younger. Uh, my grandmother, was like the family doctor. And I grew up in the island, so I grew up in the Caribbean. So we have a very heavy influence when it comes to botanical medicine. So she used to always be the go-to person for um, when someone's sick, what should we do? So I kind of gleaned a lot as far as botanical medicine from her and from that, I actually worked as a x-ray technologist prior to becoming a naturopathic doctor. And I saw, I got to see a lot of how um, our medical system works and also how um, there's so much more that could be done, especially like Tara was saying, in terms of diet, nutrition, um, physical wellness, just making more preventative medicine choices. So um, I got interested in naturopathic medicine and the principles and everything that, that it lines up with, it lines up with me. So uh, that's how I became a naturopathic doctor. And a naturopathic doctor is like a culmination of um, of course, a family medicine doctor, uh, almost like a nutritionist, as well as chiropractor, as well as we, we more so look at whole health or um, we treat the whole person is how we like to say. It. So in terms of making sure that mental, emotionally, that you're checked in, that you have support there, um, where Dr. Divya comes in, making sure nutritionally that you're, you're taking care of everything Thing you need to like where Tara comes in and then on top of that making sure your lab levels making sure your system your organs are working fu and functioning optimally and my expertise more so comes in when it comes to hormones and hormone balancing both in males and females because just like we're going to talk about eventually today cortisol is one of those stress hormones that does the number on the body so um, hormones I do a lot of um, regenerative injection therapy as well as IV nutrient therapy. So a means of allowing the body to actually get nutrients at more therapeutic doses into the, the body without going through the GI system. So that's a really effective way that I like to use. And also on top of that, addressing fatigue, addressing just family medicine things like the cholesterol, like the hypertension or high blood pressure, and um, being sure that 
the whole person is treated and supported and feeling good. So um, that's my area of expertise. I love doing what I do and I look forward to just the discussion today and continuing, especially in this landscape where people feel or we're in positions where we can't do as much as we used to, just figuring out little things that we can do and to empower us and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I look forward to uh, delve, uh, digging in a bit deeper in our discussion. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, Chris. And uh, I, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Dr. Divya Kakaya. And uh, Dr. Kakaya, please tell us, give us an overview about uh, your, your area of expertise and specialty. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. It's such a delight and an honor to be on this panel. And I'm really glad that what you're doing is focusing on wellness for the CEOs, wellness in the community. I just think that uh, we're needing to talk more about that. So, you know, as, as you can see, my background is in uh, integrative psychology. So I'm a psychologist who has a postdoctoral degree that's a master of science in psychopharmacology. So when I went to get that degree, that was all about, oh, I think I might want to be a prescribing psychologist. And then I made a lovely U-turn from all that <laughs> and decided that mm -mm -mm, the damage caused by those medications is way too much. And, and really, and I saw that with my patients because I have been in practice before Prozac even came out. Uh, and so I've seen the damage that happens at a metabolic level with psychiatric medication. So what I've begun to do in my practice here in the last 10, 11 years is I have introduced a treatment modality called neurofeedback. And neurofeedback is basically, uh, think about it as a physical therapy for the brain. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks who come to me have done years and years of counseling and psychotherapy, and they've worked through some of those family of origin issues. But at the brain level, there are still some hiccups. And so what I work on doing is really working on regulation. And when the brain gets regulation, what starts to happen is that the person's life begins to feel more regulated. And then when we feel more regulated, what happens for us is we're able to make better decisions. We're able to actually kind of be more mindful. And I've had a lot of folks I've worked with there because one of the things I talk about is really the importance of meditation. In, in your wellness, uh, kind of like your wellness toolbox, so to speak. And what I found is that once some folks have done a number of sessions of neurofeedback, they're then actually able to bring that brain into a calm enough spot where they can begin to do the meditation because I see meditation and breath as like huge in terms of what we do. So very much like Dr. Frank, I grew up in an Indian family in East Africa, in Kenya. And, you know, you, if I got a cut, the first thing my mom put on that was turmeric because that's your antiviral, antibacterial, antimicrobial, anti-everything. So grew up in a very integrated way. So it was very natural for me when I ran an eating disorder clinic for like 25 years, which I don't do anymore, that it was very integrative. So I had naturopathic doctors there. We did yoga. We did acupuncture. We did expressive arts therapy. So I am very much about engaging all of you into what it is that we do for your care and really being able to find those modalities where you can have that creative expression and you can have those outlets. And, and as we talk more about the wellness, um, you folks will see the things that, that are very important to me in terms of nudging people to be able to introduce into their lives. Because, you know, I consider myself a a person who's there to kind of help you optimize your brain, but also bring you to a place where you can then begin to do those things that are challenging for you. But now that your brain gets out of the way, then the mind can do what the mind wants to be able to do. So that's, there's a very big distinction. I try to get my uh, folks that come to me to really see how the brain, and, 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 and I'm very passionate about destigmatizing 
mental illness, because I think that's a huge piece in our country. So when we talk about brain wellness, what we're really doing is we're talking about brain health. And what I find is that when, when we speak in those ways, then people are more amenable to coming and getting care for this beautiful three and a half pound organ that we have that uh, is the only one we're going to have for right now for the rest of our lives. So uh, Kim, that's my passion about what I do. And, and I hope that gives a good introduction for what we do here at Health Everything. All right. Well, thank you so much. As you can see, we have just an awesome, awesome panel to begin this discussion. So, you know, each of us have our own perspectives of the challenges, but there's some other things that can have uh, a bit more connected uh, uh, view about <laughs> the challenges and the trends that many of us as CEOs run, having to juggle, you know, our, 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 our personal lives, our individual selves, as well as our companies we're running. So um, perhaps if we could start with um, uh, uh, Dr. Frank, if you could start from there, what are some of the top challenges that you're seeing related to the trends from COVID-19 that uh, CEOs should be aware of? Yeah, so some of the top challenges that I've noticed um, with a lot that has been going on related to the COVID-19 is just when it comes to actual wellness overall, just like we're going to discuss today. So uh, more people are losing sleep, more people are having difficulty eating, more people are realizing the intense stress and the way they deal with it is not the most beneficial. So we're turning to various things and it seems like this, this onslaught of um, just stress and overexposure from whether it be social media, whether it be um, just in our daily lives now is what's leading to a lot of the physical manifestations. So I'm noticing persons coming in with higher blood pressure now that I've, we've opened back up the office, their blood pressures have elevated. Um, I'm noticing people that are completely exhausted because they haven't been sleeping well. And um, with the COVID-19 in particular, there are persons who you know, either think that they're sick when they get, you know, an upper respiratory infection. So it leads from just, is this just a, a, an upper respiratory infection into the path of, do I have COVID-19? So that's that added mental stress, which, which further decreases the immune system. So um, that, those are some of the top issues I'm seeing. A lot of manifestations physically of what people are internalizing or going through mentally and, and emotionally. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. How about Tara, from your perspective of the challenges that the diet and nutrition is, is uh, impacting uh, uh, us as uh, you know, going through this COVID-19? You know, there's, there's three big things that I'm seeing. And the first one I think, you know, and we can all relate to this, I think has to do a lot with the personality type of the CEO. Mm -hmm. You know, the CEO is a person who will prioritize everything first, you know, family will come first, business will come first. And usually what that means is that self comes last. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the environmental things that we used to utilize in order to take care of our nutrition, um, you know, whether that's ordering food, whether that's um, meal delivery services, going to the gym, things like that, a lot of these things we used to use are no longer there. So in addition to the normal stress that that we have. Um, we're also, you know, homeschooling kids and trying to get every, everything done. But on top of that, we have to figure out how to cook, you know, how to get groceries, um, how to preserve food so we're not going to the grocery store every single week. And these are very new skills for a lot of people. And what I'm seeing as a symptom that they're avoiding eating, you know, they're avoiding dealing with it. They're working hard all day long and then it's hitting them late at night. It's kicking up their stress hormones, which is typically resulting in um, stress eating, emotional eating and overeating in, in general. And so that cycle between, you know, under eating and overeating is, is a huge thing that, that I'm seeing. Um, and then reliance on more shelf stable food. Um, you know, this is cutting down quite a bit on, you know, pre and probiotics that, that are critical for gut health and then also for immune function. Um, so not only are, are people kind of running themselves ragged from a food standpoint, um, honestly, from a very, you know, good intent 
and they're just trying to take care of everyone, but they're running themselves ragged and then refueling with things that aren't necessarily um, boosting their immune health, boosting their, their physical health. Um, and then finally turning to both food and alcohol to manage slash buffer the feelings of stress and, um, and, and emotions. Wow, uh, so insightful. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Kakai, just rounding that up with the challenges as you're seeing it from the mental health, how is that, those uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, challenges manifesting ourselves with regards to our overall mental health? And I think, I think so, so what I believe that what CEOs have really struggled with because remember, it's almost like, you know, when, when we go in the plane and if there's any turbulence, they always say, put your mask on first before you take care of everybody else. But I think the natural knee-jerk reaction when you have a traumatic event, because, you know, um, COVID-19 is a trauma event for us, right? It is something we've never, ever experienced in our life before. So that automatic reaction that a lot of CEOs have had is, you know, when you get into that fight, flight, freeze mode, is they've just sort of gone into over-functioning for their staff. And I think because staff has been so fearful and we kind of needed to like literally pivot on March 13th. I've had patients who've called March, th you know, Friday, March 13th, that just remained Friday, March 13th for three months, you know, that's how, how everybody feels about it. Mm -hmm. But what CEOs did is they just kind of needed to take care of their employees. They needed to calm down the fears. They needed to simultaneously be looking at how do you, how do I shut my business down? How do I stay on top of my operating expenses? How do I apply for the PPP loan? I mean, there was just so many moving parts for CEOs that my what I saw and what I've seen as a challenge for a lot of CEOs is this, this struggle to try to be everything for everybody and then really not taking care of themselves. So I, I would hope that now, and typically we know that in the trauma world, when a traumatic event occurs, usually if... Uh, 20% of out of 100% of people who experience trauma, 20% will develop PTSD. And typically it begins to show up about three months after the event has occurred. So now as things are opening up a little bit, I would imagine that all of our CEOs who just like hunker down and did what they needed to do, that as they may breathe, they may now tap into what their brain health challenges are for themselves. And I hope that they're able to like, we're all able to take the time to come forward and say, now I want to breathe. I need to put my mask on and I need, not literally, but I need to put my mask on and take care of me and really start to begin to, to breathe into me and take care of my own emotional health, physical health, um, uh, psychological health and spiritual health. I mean, that's a huge part of it as well. Yeah. Well, I look forward to, as part of this discussion, kind of delving into uh, some of those, those areas. Let's mm -hmm. advance to the next slide, please. So talk, each of you talked about some of the physical manifestations and you talked about some of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about the impact of some of the symptoms mm -hmm. that some of you mentioned with regards to be it um, you know, the, the, you, know, um, you talked about gut health, for example, Tara, and, and probiotics, and, you know, you hear so many commercials related to that. What are some of the issues that, you know, happen when you kind of not understanding about the gut health issue or over-reliance on, you know, the sugar, fat, uh, sweets, or alcohol to pacify you as you deal with the stress? Can, can you kick off this segment? this section of this discussion for us? I'd love to. Um, yes, there's, there's two big things that you're talking about right there. So when you think of gut health, sometimes we can overcomplicate it. You know, it can seem kind of intimidating, like, oh my gosh, how do I make my gut healthy? Um, and really what you can, you know, kind of what it boils down to is giving your body sort of pre and probiotics. And that is very simple. That is essentially fruits and vegetables and fiber, you know, so we don't have to get lost in a lot of um, those details, but but so since we're relying on a lot of more shelf stable, a lot of more sugar and processed carb based things, we're really robbing our digestive tract of the tools that it needs to, to function optimally. And what that means in this context is um, 
usually reduced emotion. Um, and so really trying to do the best that you can um, by prioritizing getting some fresh fruits and vegetables into your diet. And please note I'm saying doing the best that you can. If you have not seen a vegetable for the past six months, please do not think that you have to all of a sudden only eat kale. Um, you know, start, start with where you are and take a small step forward. Um, the other big thing that I'm seeing from a physical standpoint, which manifests itself in, in mental, so I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say, um, is really blood sugar issues. Um, and this is a combination of, you know, fasting or going too long without eating because you're solving the world's problems instead of taking care of yourself. Um, that releases adrenaline in our body. That releases our stress hormones. So not only do you have these external stressors that are huge and real and important, mm -hmm. um, you have an internal stressor that is really exacerbating that. Mm -hmm. And what, address, what adrenaline does is it causes us to crave sugars in the form of sweets or carbs or alcohol. So we get stuck in this, in this cycle that almost feels like something we just can't get out of. Mm -hmm. um, and then physically that makes us, it's hard to manage our mood. Um, our tempers get really, really short. We start to see more abdominal weight gain. Um, and that's usually the physical symptoms, but it's usually rooted in us either avoiding eating um, or turning to foods that are low in protein or fiber in order to solve hunger. So why all of a sudden has there been this recent discussion around kind of gut health and related to stress and all of this? Is there some big, huge development that all of a sudden made this the topic of discussion? Well, I think there's two reasons. I think within COVID, the reason we've been talking about it more is because of the role of immune function and, and digestion, you mm -hmm. know, and so that's really brought it to the surface. Um, now, it's been a topic, you know, I would say it's probably as, as dietary trends go, which there's a lot of them, it's been on the forefront probably for the last um, I don't know, and I would love your feedback, maybe like two years, I would say it's probably been more mainstream. Um, and that can be a lot of different, a, a lot of different things. I don't think it's as much uh, immune function as trying to figure out, you know, what are the roles of, of other hot topics like gluten? Um, why are we seeing, you know, people following a less processed diet having different, um, different results than people following a more processed diet? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's just, it's, it's become people are becoming a little bit more interested because we're diving into the details of nutrition rather than just looking at carbs, fat, you know, calories, things along those lines. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank, would you like to contribute to some of these issues that people are seeing as far as physical wellness? Yeah, I'll piggyback on the gut health component of it um, and even bring in the concept of understanding that Sometimes we are considered more bacteria than we are human because there are more, um, our microbiome is filled with many more uh, bacteria than we have human cells. So um, gut health really is important when it comes down to um, having a healthy diet and making the right choices in foods, balancing our blood sugar, because then that skipping meals and um, going into a, not really a binge type, but overeating more so causes that insulin dysregulation, which leads to insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes. So these are the little stepping stones that tend to occur. And even from the immune component of it, your GALT, your gut-associated lymphoid tissue is one of the biggest immune cells, because if you think about it, a lot of pathogens um, enter the body via your gut, via your oral, because you're eating all the time. And of course, you're breathing all the time. So um, that immune system within your gut has to be primed and ready and we do so by taking care like um, Tara said with prebiotics probiotics healthy diet and just making the steps toward that I'll even take it a step further and in going into um, the cardiovascular side of things and how when we look at the concept of sit-in now sit-in these days has increased we are in front of screens we are sitting um, we are you know just kind of deep inside of just being, working and taking care of things, especially as the CEO, you've not only got your own family to take care of, you've got employees, you've got various other components to manage. So um, there is increased hours in sit-in, which is now considered the new smoking because the impact that it has on your cardiovascular health is profound. 
that they've even compared it to um, sitting for at least eight hours without any physical activity has been compared to dying from obesity or smoking. So this is where we, we want to take in the concept of, okay, I need to get active. So that's, that's one other part that I would say, hey, let's get active, let's get moving, let's take care of that cardiovascular health. Yeah, I think that you know, there's so many kind of initiatives and things that may be worth a, worth worthwhile to do a walk challenge that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm certain some of the, when people, I'm one of those people that uses the metrics of keeping track of, you know, the activities I'm doing. So the companies that are getting exposed to that data are just seeing how sedentary all of us have become, you know, because we're, you know, uh, you know, not moving around. Well, let's go to the next uh, topic here. If we can advance the slide, Chris. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kakaya, if you can share with us, you know, we talked about the, you know, the gut health and issues and how it impacts the immunity. What about on the mental side? Is it possible for us to change our mental behavior? I mean, there's so much that people don't know about the brain and concentration and all of those things. Tell us, what can we do? I think the number one thing, Kim, that I talk about is for brain health is sleep. When our sleep is disrupted, our brain does not get a chance to cleanse itself. There's a system in the brain called the glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system becomes activated. It's very similar to the lymphatic system that removes the toxins from the body. We have an actual system that goes into play at night when we sleep that cleanses the brain from toxins. So when we think about mental wellness, mental health issues, one of the ways in integrative psychology we think about it is to think of uh, inflammation of the brain. So when you have inflammation in the brain, you can have things like depression, you can have anxiety, you can have PTSD, you can have um, OCD. So think about it in terms of inflammation of the brain. So just as we're talking about the gut health, sleep to me is like the number one critical thing. And there's, there's even a phrase that's been going around that's corona somnia is what they call it. Because the number one issue that people are coming back in for right now is disrupted sleep. So when we regulate the sleep, we calm the brain down, we cleanse the brain because stress is a toxin when we build those toxins during the daytime, when we go to sleep at night is when the brain releases those toxins. So actually when we're in our dream states in sleep, all the neurons in the brain shrink and the cerebrospinal fluid uh, washes through the brain, bathes the brain out and cleanses the brain and gets removed through the cerebrospinal fluid. So sleep is like the number one thing I think about. And because we've been in front of so many screens, I think that our circadian rhythms have been really impacted because of that. So in whatever way in which we can kind of pull away from that and get back to more regulated sleeping, I'm convinced that these brain health issues that are showing up right now, post COVID, there's a lot we can do to kind of soothe the brain and calm down the inflammation that's going on in the brain. Well, as, as someone who uh, personally has been sleep challenged, it seems, as I've gotten older and older, but I've also realized as the CEO of, of, of being CEO of seven companies, the more complex, you know, mental gymnastics you have to go through and, and seeing the impact of sleep, you know, um, you know, those, those, you know, issues and, and it's caused a whole big, huge industry. I mean, sleep aids have become like a tr multi, multi-trillion dollar industry. And so, you know, what are, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, when you think about um, not, we're not going to get to solutions yet, but more just kind of the impact of not having enough sleep manifests itself as a, you know, leader running your company. Where, you know, what are some of the challenges that you can see that impacting? 
think I think you see shortness. I think you see irritability. I see you know you decision making gets affected because you know you're not able to like pause. So so where it can show up is sort of like the emotional climate of a company. So when you have somebody who's sleep deprived, the processing is going to be much more slower, right? So if you have a CEO that's not processing at the speed at which he or she ought to be processing at, or they're moving too fast and they're making decisions very quickly, you don't have that equipoise that, that keeps the ship of your company running in a calm, stable way. So I think where it shows up in companies would be uh, that emotional tenor that you would see within the company because you have a, a sleep deprived person that's at the head and that person and, and also remember if the sleep if the brain has not had a chance to rejuvenate itself then during daytime during waking hours the brain is going to be working three times harder in order to get the same work done. Mm-hmm. So then you have more efforting going on. So sleep I think becomes a huge huge priority and you know turning off those those screens i know we'll come to solutions but the screens are like huge in terms of how they disrupt sleep um thanks so much and i would love to hear from dr frank tara is just contributions because i think this whole sleep issue is such a big a big one would love to hear uh your your perspectives on this mm-hmm. yeah i'll i'll add in that um even on top of the sleep um just like dr kakaya said we are uh, now falling back on, especially as CEOs and leaders of companies, now falling back on, well, I need to activate my brain to get it up and going. So let's rely on more caffeine and let's um, energy drinks and everything come into play, which once again, produce physical changes where in the moment, it seems like you're on top of your game. You've got everything down pack, but later on, just over time, and it may not take a lot of time these days, especially with the other things happening, over time, your brain just gets run down. So I completely agree. Sleep is one of those. That's a medicine. That's mm-hmm. uh, maybe I think baby has. Okay, great. And Tara, uh, your comments on that? Absolutely. I'm so happy that you brought up sleep because it's such it's so critical, and I don't think we talk about it enough. You know, we focus so much about what's happening during the day. You know especially my world, what you're putting into your body, what you're expending, but that time for repair is critical. And I can say in my practice, even pre-COVID, you know, I will be working with clients that are doing everything perfect, right? You know, everything during the day seems perfect, but their sleep is terrible, either because they're, they're um, distracted and not falling asleep or they're not getting restful sleep. And I still see symptoms in the form, sometimes big in the form of um, weight or outward symptoms, but more often in these micro behaviors throughout the day. They are, um, you know, whether it's sugar cravings or carb cravings, um, you know, the way that we are managing stress and kind of like you were saying before, um, you know, short tempered or the decision making skills are just a little bit numb. Um, and so sometimes it's not a huge symptom. It's these little things that over time just add up. So I'm going to go back to Dr. Kupai one more time with regards to this, because I think the sleep issue is huge. And in fact, you know, you hear some of the tech CEOs talk about, well, I survive on four hours of sleep or three hours of sleep. I'm certain you've heard that from uh, uh, the guy that is the, the founder of Tesla. You know, I only need four hours of sleep what's the deal? I mean, (laughs) you know, there's, I mean, there's a direct correlation between um, uh, disrupted, interrupted sleep, short periods of sleep, and developing Alzheimer's later in your life. There's a direct connection there. Mm -hmm. So yes, today, like Tara said, in the moment, uh, we may, we may think, okay, I just, took some coffee, I could make it through the day, you know, all of these little fixes we put. But in the long range, what we're doing is, and, and, and really we need to create a culture where there is no pride in the fact that you have had four hours of sleep and you run this big multi-million dollar company. There ought not to be pride in that because the price you're paying then is your health long-term your health as you go into your 50s, into your 60s, into your 70s. So we really want to be able to sustain and say, actually, I'm going to really work as a CEO. I am going to try to role model balance in my life. Mm 
-hmm. balance with exercise, balance with sleep, balance with food, balance with my movement, balance with laughter and play. Because mm -hmm. we, we, you know, when we remain that serious about everything we're doing and we're not like having boredom or we're not having laughter, we're not having play, we're kind of missing the essence of life because life is about having those joyful moments where we can just go oh, let loose. So I think finding balance, finding joy, finding those simple pleasures, I think all of that, and CEOs can be pivotal in, the, in what they set up as their, uh, the, the theme they want in their company, like the, the culture of their company. Right. Well, now we get to the moment that uh, many of us have been waiting for. We're gonna talk about some solutions. Uh, on, and we're gonna talk about solutions on both the physical and the mental side. Um, so let's start with the physical piece. Uh, uh, how about uh, we start that out with uh, Dr. Frank? What can we do to improve some of the challenges yeah. we're facing in this COVID-19 as leaders of these companies? So physically, um, like I said, if we're going to be sitting long, extended hours, uh, we need to get up and start moving. Movement not only restores um, muscle tissue and, and cardiovascular health movement in general, especially if you go take a walk outside. Um, I usually recommend that um, if it's going to be walking, make sure it's sunlight. We're in sunny San Diego right now. It's a little foggy, but <laughs> make sure you get into the sunlight for at least 30 minutes. So that takes care of your vitamin D. Um, minimum 30 minutes. Hopefully you can get 45 minutes to an hour, but get your vitamin D up, get your mental emotional health up with releasing good neurotransmitters and hormones. And, and on top of that, if you can do even more than walking, if you can start weight resistance, like take, for example, we're all at home most of the time. If you have kids, that's your weight resistance right there. <laughs> Play with your kids, you know, get active, get moving, get involved with the family. Those are some of the physical activities that I, um, that I can see as you know, a CEO as someone in charge as trying to take care of so many people that you can do still being interactive and engaged, but at the same time, leading by example, by walking, running, doing hiking, whatever you like to do, and doing it on a daily basis as number one, sort of your escape, and number two, uh, a check mark on taking care of that physical activity, cardiovascular, um, and musculoskeletal health. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. How about you, Tara? When you think about some of the solutions on the physical side, what are some of the things from your perspective? So I think that there's, there's three main things that people can do that would have a pretty significant impact. Um, and the, f the first one, this isn't super exciting, is um, making meal planning a priority on some level. And now when I say, I don't mean you have to turn into the people on Instagram or social media with their like boiled chicken and what broccoli in containers. That is not what I mean. But, but what I do mean is, you know, recognizing that you will get hungry, recognizing that you are, that you do need to eat and have a solution for it. And I bring this up because, you know, we, I find that most people, it's not that they're avoiding nutrition or they're avoiding eating, but they're just spread so thin. And so they suffer from decision fatigue. They get overwhelmed by the idea of doing it. And so they avoid it until the last minute. And like we started out, that leads to sugar craving, carbs, carb cravings, and it gets us stuck in the cycle. And so really view your nutrition as kind of a system on some level. You know, there's, there's things, you know, we, we think that we should just wing our food, you know, oh, my kitchen is so close, so I'll just figure it out. Um, and that honestly doesn't work in the same way that doesn't work for your bookkeeping, you know, or other systems in your business, it doesn't work for your health. So making meal planning on some level a priority. Um, I would love for people to be eating, have some source of protein every single time they eat. It does not need to be animal protein. That can be beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, um, but something that's going to break down a little bit slower and keep their blood sugar stable. Ideally, it'd be great to combine it with the fruit or vegetable, um, but start where, wherever you are. And then finally, you know, and this ties a lot into sleep and stress, um, but I'm seeing a lot of low levels of magnesium um, and magnesium helps a lot with sleep. It helps us manage stress. And so we can get ma magnesium from our whole grains, beans and lentils, but I do, and I, I'm not supplement first, I'm food first, but I do find that a lot of people benefit from taking a, a really good magnesium citrate, good magnesium uh, glycinate, 
that's going to help promote that restful sleep that we've been talking about. Um, and quite simply, have you wake up, you know, feeling great, wake up, have more of those mornings where you wake up and you're like, oh, that was a good sleep. I feel really, really good. Yeah. Uh, how about with regards to solutions for the mental uh, wellness? Um, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. King? So, so I think, I think for, for brain wellness, um, for me, one of the best solutions, big, or two, two of the best solutions really are uh, breath and, and meditation. Mm -hmm. And what I find is, you know, when we do breathing, so for example, you know, when you breathe, you close your left nostril and you breathe deeply through your right nostril, you're bringing a ton more oxygen to the left part of your brain, which then allows you to make better decisions because your left brain is your more linear, more, more logical, more organized decision maker. And then when you close your right nostril and you breathe here, then you're taking a lot more oxygen into your right brain. So the breath is really valuable in calming down the brain inflammation. Let's think about it that way, right? Mm -hmm. And with breath, we're just really restoring the body in a very significant way. Meditation is different from breath in that you're really taking that time to just really uh, focus on one thing. You might have a passage, like I do a passage meditation. So you have a passage. And because I have this thing that we call the monkey mind, my mind wants to go all over the place. You know, the minute, I'm, if I'm saying a passage very slowly, and the minute I start thinking about something else, my meditation is I have to come back to the first sentence again. So again, I'm retraining my mind to really come back to center is what I'm doing, bringing it back to center. Research shows that when we meditate half an hour on a daily basis, within six weeks of that meditation, Kim, we grow the length of the telomeres in our DNA. So that is the part of the DNA that becomes stronger. When we have longer telomeres, we are less at risk for immune conditions such as cancer, hypertension, diabetes, and all of those things. So we want to grow longer telomeres in our DNA and meditation is a direct way in which we can do that. So from the brain health perspective, I just really think about uh, meditation, breath, obviously we talked about, you know, with exercise, we know that with consistent physical exercise, there's that region in the brain called the hippocampus that gets stronger when we exercise regularly, and that improves memory. Mm -hmm. So we know that it, when any of us are overwhelmed, and there's a lot going on, and we've got multiple decisions we're making, memory can be very impaired. And exercise, breath, meditation, the balance with eating, taking care of our gut microbiome, having those good vitamin D levels. I think all of those are some of the best solutions in terms of like overall brain health, because when you have a healthy brain, chances are you're going to have a healthier body, right? Because the brain is the driver of the whole body. Wow. Well, this has been fantastic because all of you guys had suggested such holistic methods of wellness. Um, how about if, you know, you see, you know, as you know, you're, you're going through all of the things um, with, you know, running your business, running your family life. And, and as, as uh, uh, Dr. Kate mentioned, you know, we didn't get a chance to take first putting the mask on ourselves um, about the use of assessments as far as trying to figure out, you know, some solutions or kind of where you are because, you, you know, get so anxious or you get so worried about, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm middle-aged, I'm running stuff, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. What do you, what is you guys' perspective on that? How about if we start with um, a doc, you, Dr. K? And, and when you say assessments, you're thinking, what, what is the self-evaluation we can do? Yes. Or you're thinking right. assessments- About the benefit or abuse of those with regards to, like, for example, for mental, mental wellness or sleep, um, use of assessments to kind of see a baseline of some of the things that you could do or, or um, that type of thing. I, yeah, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a really good idea. I mean, you know, for most of us, when we get into that high performance mode and, you know, most CEOs are CEOs because they're high performing individuals, right? Yes, A and, to personality. Yeah. 
<laughs> right? So when you are that type A, you're high performing, I think it's always a good idea to like pause and to be able to say to yourself, uh, I think I need to pause and I need to kind of ask some self-evaluation questions. Like, what is my sleep like? What, how am I, what is my nutrition like? Am I being shorter than normal with my, with my family members around me or with my employees? So I think that's, um, however, that self-assessment tends to be challenging because when we do that, then we have to be truthful with ourselves and we have to be vulnerable with ourselves and we have to be okay to say, I am struggling a little bit. And we know that uh, for a lot of CEOs, like reaching out and being able to say, I need can be harder because they want to be like the, the person that's just like taking care of everybody else. And have and something to have like, it all together. Um, yeah. Have it. And, and, and CEOs, I think some of the best CEOs, I have a, an organization with whom we're doing Brain Health Fridays right now. And their CEO is being so vulnerable with the staff as we're doing these webinars, where we're talking about the struggles we're having right now and that it is really messy right now. And that because it is messy, we can all allow ourselves to be messy and not feel like we have to be perfect. So when that's coming down from the CEO, that's giving all the staff room to breathe and begin to take care of their brain health. Uh, how about, thanks so much for sharing that. Tara, your perspective on assessments as far as kind of seeing a baseline of where you are and what you need to do. So I think, I mean, I think assessing is is fantastic. Um, I think that coming up with a plan to change is really where the power is. Um, you know, information is only helpful if you know how to apply it. And I think a big mistake that we make in nutrition and health and diet and all of this is we we don't recognize that nutrition is a skill and it's something that we have to constantly, well, not constantly, but that we have to grow um, and keep moving forward. Typically, and especially for us type A personalities, we want to jump to the most advanced form of, of nutrition, right? We want to, you know, make these huge broad changes and they're typically not sustainable. And so when you view it as a skill, you can view it as steps, you know, okay, what is my first step? Maybe, you know, I want to focus on vitamin D um, and shooting for 30 minutes of, you know, walking every single day. Um, or maybe I'm going to focus on breathing and I'm going to set aside, you know, 20 minutes to do alternate, you know, nostril breathing. Or maybe I'm going to have some protein and really break it down into these small steps and then have a way of quantifying it. Um, because we like progress. And I think that's another reason why we're hesitant to make changes to our nutrition is because the progress can seem vague, right? You know, we like numbers, like graphs. And so if you can track these habits, you know, pick three habits, like I just said, and track them each day, and then look back at the month and be like, yes, look at how well I did this month. Or you know what, I didn't make walking a priority at all. You know, I missed that one. So how can I build on that? And so although assessments are good, coming up with a plan of action to change your behaviors is really where, where the power lies in all of this. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Frank, and your contributions with regards to that? Yeah, um, especially when it comes to assessments, I always like to recommend, uh, because knowing the, the type A, type A um, personality that we have, we, we are so strict with our schedules that you should schedule time into your day that you actually can stop and breathe, take a walk. Um, most of the time, even when it comes down to what and how we eat, uh, we tend to eat in front of a screen or eat in a rush to try to you know, get to the next thing because we've got a one o'clock something coming up. So um, actually scheduling that time, stepping away from the computer, stepping away from whatever, um, involves you as you know a CEO as and just for daily habits will help with building those building that plan as Tara was saying toward assessing the goals and, and reassessing and saying you know what I didn't schedule any time in yesterday for myself I think I'm gonna make a 15 minute block and in that 15 minute block I'm gonna journal I'm gonna record how am I feeling today what am I doing today um, what physical manifestations is going through my body and then from there you say, what can I do to make it better? And then at the end of the day, do another reassessment and say, hey, let me journal. How was today? What did I do well? What could I improve on? And you take that into the next thing. You, so, you, you build on it from there. And this not only touches on the mental, emotional, your mental health, it also touches 
on the physical components of your health, which then um, causes you to want to make healthier decisions and eat healthier and be more active and um, setting that tone, setting that example. And like Dr. Kakaya said, being vulnerable in that department saying, I'm not good in this. What can I do to get good in this? Um, is going to be one way to build and grow and become even better as a leader and as an overall <laughs> human being, just having that human being, that interpersonal relationship that we have. All right. Well, let's uh, advance to our next topic. And this has to do with some special considerations for maintaining. I mean, we've talked a bit about the challenges, issues, solutions. What are some of the things that we can do to maintain um, this, um, you know, because as you've all talked about, these are some great things that we could do, very holistic that we can do, but you know, be, you, you all know, uh, behavior change is so, so hard. Mm -hmm. What can we do, you know, be it uh, to put some of these practices in place and making them more sustainable? Um, how about we start with you, uh, Tara? So I would, um, you know, I would do something which is called kind of habit stacking and or linking it to something that, that you provide um, that you feel is valuable. And so, for instance, it's very hard to make change for ourselves, right? It's very hard to, you know, some, to do something just for ourselves. But we as CEOs or leaders or caretakers in some sort of way um, are usually really good at taking care of, of others. And so linking these behavior changes to a way of caring for others can be powerful. So here's a specific example of that. Maybe you as a CEO are recognizing that your team isn't walking, right? Um, and, and doing a challenge amongst your team where you'll be leading that challenge, you'll be leading that behavior change, but you're doing it as a form of caretaking, right? Um, and so that's gonna help you, you take responsibility. It's gonna help you lead. It's gonna make a positive change to your health while, your health while helping others. Well, that's great. Um, uh, how about uh, you, Dr. Frank? What, so, what are some of the things that uh, you would recommend that we could do to be able to maintain some of these solutions and putting them in place? Yeah, some of the things we can do um, is definitely looking back on kind of what I said, you know, journaling, taking care of that, and then being proactive in searching out things like we offer, like I, I, I'll come in with the IV nutrient component of it, being very specific with saying, I want to take care of my health. What are the tools that I can use to take care of my health? So here is a physical activity check. Here is the mental, emotional wellness check-in with journaling or breathing, yoga check. Um, what's the next step toward that? And that's where you can reach out to, you know, your various practitioners and say, what can I use to further build on that so that you can have accountability. I think accountability in the long run is, is where we're going to see that maintenance of diet, lifestyle, just overall well, um, wellness and health and well-being. So whether that accountability comes from a doctor, from you know, a practitioner, or whether it comes from your employees, whether that accountability comes from your spouse or anyone that you can have contact with, just having that accountability to say, this is what I want to work on. This is where I want to be. Will you help me get there? Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, Dr. K, how about you close our, uh, this uh, topic up for us? What things can we do to maintain that uh, mental wellness that we've talked about with sleep and breathing and uh, meditation? I think, I think one of the biggest gifts, uh, Kim, that we can give ourselves is a gift of self-compassion. I think that perfectionism is toxic. And for CEOs, you know, there's like this pride in perfectionism, like I can do this and I'm able to do this and all of that. And so what I think about is, I think about one of the kindest, most gentlest things we can do with ourselves in any of these habit changes. And, and as Tara mentioned, that habit stacking is a really good way to sustain changes and accountability is very, very important. And I think the most important we, thing we do is we, we focus on the baby steps of progress that we make and we really give ourselves lots of kudos for the progress. Because remember, when you have that high-performing person, a lot of times their checklist is about everything they didn't get done. 
And when you actively work on self-compassion and you work on reducing perfectionism in you and in your company, what you're going to be doing is you're naturally going to be bringing about an environment that's much more conducive to self-care, to empathy, to kindness and collaboration. Then you'll find CEOs that are actually going to be much more successful because, you know, we've got that accountability factor, we've got that compassion, and we've got that kindness. And I think that creates for an environment where long-lasting behavior change can happen and we're able to sustain that. So I, I just think that that's huge for all of us. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you uh, for joining us and sharing these very important insights. Um, I think we're going to go advance to the next slide uh, and share with everyone that we are going to send out the information from today's webinar and you're going to get contact information for each of our experts, Dr. Divya Kakaya, Dr. Frank Anthony, Tara Coleman, um, how you can connect and access them. Um, I also want to make mention that uh, Dr. Kakaya has recently published a new book, so we'll also include a link of Healthy Within and how you can improve your, the, your uh, use, utilizing biohealth to improve your, um, your uh, mental uh, wellness there. And um, if we could go to the next slide. I want to thank everyone for joining us and look out for our next uh, COVID-19 webinar essentials, which will be on July 30th. And we're gonna talk about new models for attracting, developing and retaining talent in this new COVID re reality. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you, our panelists again for joining us and um, wish you a great, productive, healthful day and uh, look forward to seeing you here next month. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This Bye. was great. Bye. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.